Hello everyone. I hope you're doing well and enjoying your home and have great plans for its improvement. I'm Mrs. Sherman and if you're new here please click the link in the description below the video on the channel and go to the page on which I have embedded this so you can see the rest of the things that are there and sometimes I post a poem or something I have talked about or a link that you might want to see. And so today I just want to begin by talking a little bit about preparation for the work ahead. And I believe that getting dressed, getting ready, getting bathed, dressed puts you in a mental condition of better perspective to and a mood to do the work. And so in, in doing this, I think that you do yourself and others a great service, that you respect your family and your home enough to take care of yourself. I won't go into too much more detail because you know yourself better than I do and every, everybody dresses and prepares the way that it suits them and works best for them. And I would like to read to you a little bit today uh, from The Fascinating Girl. And I know that a lot of people have objected to this book, have claimed that it was about something um, more something that it wasn't and didn't read beyond the first page and or misjudged it by reading just the reviews and I learned about it when I was when I was very young when I was single and I I think I was still a teenager when I read this and really enjoyed the parts on character because I had not been previously taught these things because I went to public school and there was although we kind of absorbed some things about character because we studied uh, history and we studied people in history. We studied all the uh, great inventors and leaders and we did kind of absorb the fact that some of them must have had some character like uh, diligence and persistence and loyalty and things like that. Uh, we didn't learn about it to the extent that was in here so I want to read some parts about character and one of them is today I'm going to read self-dignity. Now uh, last time I was talking to you about something that I began to think about later so I want to make a comment on that and that was in the book this is the fascinating girl for girls that are not married but Helen Andelin had written one called the fascinating womanhood and in it she had something in the character section talking about uh, looking on the bright side and she described several situations that her and her family had been in once when a car had broken down and um, how uh, she kept her family thinking on the bright side uh, that not all was not lost and looking on the funny side or the bright side of everything and looking to the looking to the good side if we get in the habit of that when we're very young we're very very um, fortunate because that will keep because your mind is if it breaks down uh, then you can't function and get yourself out of some kind of mess or or help anybody so I want to but this one is also on self-dignity which is different than when I was talking about when she was talking about looking on the bright side and I had discussed last time how there uh, life is part good and part bad and uh, that we don't need to go through life as young people and I'm talking to the really young if they're standing by your side if you're homeschooling this is good for them really young people expect the day to be perfect they expect people to be perfect they expect church to be perfect everybody at church to be perfect and they really do expect life to be absolutely perfect but when you learn that life is part good and part bad then you just chalk it up to uh, well that's one of the things that happened today that wasn't too pleasant and uh, how you deal with it is very important because it's a develop, helping to develop your character. Um, so self-dignity. This is really important and this is what dressing up for the home is all about is self-dignity. Now we're taught as Christians to not think of self too much. However, the Bible does say love your neighbor as yourself and uh, as a man thinks in his heart so is he. So we do have to think somewhat of our own self-dignity or we won't uh, have the uh, respect for other people. Uh, so the way you take care of yourself is the way you would take care of other people. Self-dignity. Those who have self-dignity have a proper respect for themselves. Now that is in balance. 
never place themselves in an inferior position, nor will they allow others to reduce them to an inferior position. They have a stability of spirit, a feeling of self-worth, which keeps them from being treated as an inferior. This is really important because uh, in one section of this book, which I couldn't find, there's no uh, index in it, it said that if you lacked confidence, don't get yourself in social situations where you feel inferior, where you feel you don't, you can't uh, excel or you don't belong or you can't, you don't, you're not needed there. And don't uh, dress in an inferior way. And it doesn't mean that you wear high-end clothes, but it just means don't put, don't get yourself in a situation where uh, you feel inferior. Uh, that is not to suggest to be the opposite or be conceited in any way. Those who lack self-dignity tend to be too willing to please. That is a sore point with many people, and that is that uh, there's a scripture in one of the Timothys that says that the servant of God must not be quarrelsome, but be peaceable uh, and get along with everybody. And sometimes that is... Put the that is emphasized the wrong way, and so when people are treated very badly or in an inferior way, uh, they just sit and suck it suck it up, and they don't assert themselves or in any way object uh, because they're supposed to be peaceable, and they know that if they say something, the other person will push back, and then there'll be an argument, and. Uh, so I, I ran across it here, of course, and, and now, of course, can't find it. Um, and it was about how to, um, it says, uh, you, although you have to have some, some humility, you also have to have the courage to stand up for what is right when, it, when it's, you know, necessary. So, I want to continue with this. Uh, those who lack self-dignity tend to be too willing to please. In an effort to win friendship of another person, they do many special favors. Now, I also read from that book, Winsome Womanhood, that was written in 1900, uh, and it had a very similar message to young girls. And I, I think it's kind of nice that when you're 15 or 14 or 13 that there's a special book written for you. And I think every mother could write a special, just a little notebook or a little scrapbook for her child at whatever age they are and say this is these are some of the things you can do when you are you know such and such age and this is the possibilities and this is the wonderful age that you have and how to appreciate it and uh, enjoy enjoy that year because you'll aren't going to be 14 or 15 for one year and I think everybody could write a little booklet for their child and give them something to read and to and to cherish. We see an example of this in young children. A neglected child may try to win the favor of a well thought of child by giving him gifts and doing special favors. He lets him in front in a lunch line, shares his prizes with him, lets him grab the last swing on the playground, and a thousand and one other things he's not deserving of in an effort to win his friendship. Unfortunately, this does not win the favor of the well-thought-of child, but usually only awakens a feeling of lack of respect because of the child's inability to appear as an equal. People of all ages make this mistake. College students, for example, sometimes loan cars and clothes to those they consider their superiors in an effort to win their favor. An unpopular boy may loan his car to a boy he considers socially respected. A plain, shy girl may loan her clothes to a girl she considers better looking and more popular, or she may offer to do her dishes, sew her clothes, or cater to other requests in an unconscious effort to win her friendship. Sadly enough, instead of winning favor, they are more apt to further be spurned for their lack of self-respect. Now, this is a problem, I think, also with the on the other side, where a person thinks that a girl at home, or a homemaker, or a, a, a girl that goes to church, 
should be a servant, should serve others, should do things for other people. And uh, somehow they get the idea that uh, a church is a, is a public service or that women at home are should provide public service for people or char- lots of charity since, of course, they're not um, earning their way, so to speak. And so many homemakers get caught up in trying to help people and that's time that's very valuable that never can be run uh, one back that they need to be giving to their precious precious family once in a while we may meet a person who strives valiantly to please us in other ways they meet us with ingratiating smiles listen eagerly every time we open our mouths anticipate our every wish laugh mirthfully Last, laugh mirthfully at every jest and magnify our very every accomplishment. I'm sure you have all, as homemaker ladies at home, uh, had this experience where it seemed like, although you were s- serious, the person that was listening to you or seemed to be every time they were around would uh, laugh in a way which I call uh, just foolish, shallow laughing at everything you said as though you were very witty and I always felt like saying um, what am I a a comedy show (laughs) and uh, but could never find anything why but it could be that they uh, are trying they feel inferior in some way or we don't know really it could be just rudeness it's just maybe they don't know any better and they don't have any conversational skills so they just laugh all the time um, we don't really know. This this lady seems to think that uh, it's because they feel inferior. They humble themselves to the point that they are, we are afraid that they are going to bow. And in spite of a hundred and one things they do for us deserving of gratitude, we can't help uh, to dislike their lack of self-dignity. Uh, their fault lies in thinking too much of us and too little of themselves. Well, we can do the same way. Think too much of others and too little of ourselves. And of course, we're taught from the time we're little um, not to think too highly of ourselves, as the Bible says. And uh, that is interpreted for us sometimes by other people who say if you if you uh, want to take time for yourself and you want to take care of yourself and you don't want to do things uh, for other people that you're, you've conceded or you think too highly of themselves, I think that scripture needs to be looked at a little more carefully. Um, because it does say, do not think too highly of yourselves. We are glad to accept the approval of our equals, but are little flattered by those who consider themselves our inferiors. If the person is a woman, we can't help expecting her to respect herself as a human being, uh, equal to all other human beings. We see her cringe and self-effacement before us. We are naturally disappointed. Those who lack self-dignity also tend to be too servile. This is an uh, this is an unfortunate fault in young single women who always want to be doing something for other people because they they've been taught that you know as a Christian they'd be a servant of everybody or that maybe someone will like them or admire them or accept them if they uh, look like they're generous givers and 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 unfortunately uh, they. Uh, don't understand their their worth and their dignity. Um, take for example a woman who makes a slave of herself for her friends. The poor thing is always called on, on to do this or do that or the other thing and is never heard to hesitate or complain. Uh, so when we see this this wonderful creature, a woman, transformed into a mechanical drudge, we can't help feeling a certain sorrow for her failing to fall below her standards. So uh, she goes on to talk about how to avoid uh, being inferior and how to have dignity. And here's one that I have mentioned that every young girl needs to, and boy needs to and woman at home it's for everybody needs to really listen to another way a girl may lack self dignity is in the t- tendency she may have to belittle herself now we all do that don't we someone compliments us on something and we'll say oh that's just an old such and such i got at the thrift shop you know and i think it's better just to say thank you 
uh, and keep your mouth shut about the history of everything and have some dignity. Such remarks as, I'm so dumb. Oh, I, I remember feeling like crying the first time I heard a young woman say, well, I'm just so dumb. Because what that does is it makes her seem inferior to her children who hear that. And uh, what child wants to have a mother who who is inferior? So, Or she'll say, uh, my face isn't shaped right, or my hair is so stringy or such and such. My complexion is broken out again. Our expressions which discredit herself to others. These negative statements. Also, it's a very personal. We need to keep our mouth shut about these um, things that we feel inferior about. We need to just keep our mouth shut about it. And not, not reveal personal things uh, to other people. And I think that personal things, when you think personal things, think person body. We don't need to discuss everything that's going on in our body, how our hair is falling out and or things like that. These negative statements only reaffirm her weak points both in her mind and those of her friends and indicate a lack of self-respect. She may of course be just fishing for uh, compliments and also for reassurance, but this motive does, does little for the picture of self-dignity. Another sign of lack of self-dignity is a tendency to be easily pushed around, walked on, or abused, and it is not on our human nature to respect those who can be trampled on. So a later chapter will deal with this special problem and will outline just the right way to handle these situations in which she's being mistreated that will preserve her self-dignity. Still another evidence of lack of self-dignity is in placing oneself in the position of pleading or begging. See that is something we forget sometimes where someone maybe uh, somehow makes us feel inferior or threatens and we beg or plead and uh, women don't realize that it reduces one to an inferior position. Self-dignity implies a, a dignified bearing and attitude. It's a matter of character. In no way indicates a lack of humility, but rather shows a proper respect for self as we would for any other of God's creatures. I have explained the different situations in which women lower themselves to an inferior position. Sometimes, however, others are to blame for placing you in the position of disadvantage. There is a tendency for those who have more money, clothes, or talent to take on an air of superiority which is quite discomforting. Knowing how to deal with these persons in a way which will preserve our self-dignity is all important. And I have seen young people who come from a humble home, but they, they have normal dignity. It's just that they don't have a lot of privileges or they don't have nice furniture, nice cars, nothing. And they'll go to visit a relative and the relative has all this stuff and is very freewheeling and comes under their influence and starts to feel inferior in his own home but the with the influence of all this comes uh, other things and the they get their character uh their character suffers because the other people maybe uh, have different values and uh, it can really hurt the family. So now she deals with something called the snob and this is where I'm hoping to find the part where she says don't go to places or be around people that make you feel lack of self-confidence or make you feel inferior. If you want to build uh, confidence uh, and I'm saying this to young people because it's hard when you're around people who look down on you and if you feel they look down on you and even when you get vital like me you do run into people who somehow you sense that they lo they're looking down on you because you're not interested maybe in uh, some of the material things in life that they are interested in okay so the snob <laughs> A person who has money or material advantage and who de deliberately uses them to make another person feel inferior is known as a snob. These people seem to derive a fiendish joy from parading their possessions or accomplishments before others that would shame a savage gloating over his head. His head. Sensitive and gentle women are apt to be dis 
discomposed somewhat in the face of such rude vanity. With a little thought, however, you can succeed in giving the snob the contempt and indifference she deserves, and the secret is this. As long as you respond to her tactics with obvious pain, she will be rewarded and will continue her course pastime of gloating over her supposed superiority. The minute, however, that you stop showing pain at her jibes, she will lose all pleasure in making them and transfer her attention, unfortunately, to another. Moreover, she will respect you for your self-dignity, your refusal to be made to feel inferior. She cannot help feeling a wholesome admiration for those who are superior to her attack. Your attitude of mind is really the most important factor in determining how either the snob or anyone else is going to treat you. Well, that is true, and I think all of you who are vital can remember one time in your life, at least one time. Most of us hesitate to stand up to anybody. We don't want to be argumentative. We don't want to have leave memories with other people of us throwing a fit. So maybe one time in your life you might remember standing up to someone uh, and just saying no and how they treated you a little more gingerly the next time. Uh, and I remember seeing a woman once who's uh, some young person was telling her off and shouting at her and everything and so instead of responding this older woman just uh, folded her arms and looked down at her nose at that person and didn't even respond and it made the other person who was attacking very nervous <laughs> and uh, and she just turned around and walked away but um, I'm sure you can get a lot of hints from other people. Whether in the forms just mentioned or in the many modifications of them, lack of self-dignity is always distasteful. Unless you respect yourself as the creature you were created and intended to be, others cannot respect you. Unless you have respect for yourself, you cannot maintain the proper bearing in your associations with others, either in the family or in social life. No matter how admirable your other attributes, society will regard you as alien. Finally, without self-dignity, an otherwise admirable character is discredited. Now, of course, take everything in balance. Uh, this is a chapter on self-dignity, so it has said self-dignity a lot. So you can't say, well, you just emphasize self-dignity way too much. This is a chapter on it to get familiar with it, and we do it, we have it in balance. And I have seen people who have developed self-dignity online, like they get to go in on email with someone, a friend, that somebody that they know uh, in real life, and uh, suddenly the emails start going downhill, and the other person is swearing at them and calling them names and accusing them of stuff. And the person, one person who experienced that told me that the last time that it, at first she tried to negotiate, you know, and she would write back and try to find out what was wrong and get a little, little bit more to the heart of the matter, but it just got worse. So uh, one day she just didn't answer and that stopped that. Um, in building self-dignity, it's important to first take a good look at yourself. If you are a weak, lazy, irresponsible girl who never does anything upon which to build respect, you see, she's giving the balanced view of this now, you are defeated before you begin. You will first have to work to be at your best if you expect to build self-respect, which will make you feel equal to others. This goes along with the Victorian history book that I read you, Linda Lichter's book, um, Simple Social Graces or the Benevolence of Manners, where she talked about how the Victorians never felt they deserved to have self-esteem until they had done something to deserve it, until they had developed the character to deserve it or lived in such a way as to deserve it. They never felt that they should uh, get therapy or anything because they lacked self-esteem. And so here she's teaching you how to do it. In building self-dignity, it's important to first take a good look at yourself. You'll first have to work to be at your best if you expect to build a self-respect which will make you feel equal to others. First, straighten up your character and make something of your life and strive to be a person of real worth. Now, when we're talking about character today, one of the qualities of character that many of us weren't taught when we were younger and in, in a public school was always... Uh, if when you they didn't teach you how to uh, do things like accept invitations or answer things or answer letters or 
be on time to something or or uh, if you couldn't go somewhere where you had promised to go, you were supposed to contact them and tell them you couldn't go. And and to this day, there are some people who are vital that still don't do that. They don't show up because they just were never taught to do it and never got in the habit. Um, all, also, always appear at your best. You know, I'm so happy that I... I'm starting to develop that habit again to always appear at my best. I always I noticed throughout my years as a homemaker that when there was uh, some kind of problem in the home or a, an atmosphere of, of unease or someone was upset or everything, I would take a look at uh, how early I had gotten up and whether I had bothered to get a shower and get dressed. And usually people are happier and more stable if you... the the mother, the guide of the home, the guard of the home, even if you're not a mother, uh, her presence lights the home. Uh, if you will uh, dress uh, for dignity and always appear at your best, you'll find that other people's moods, although they might not have good character and they might be not very nice people, uh, they're not so bad <laughs> when you dress up. Um, if your hair, your clothes, and a lot of times uh, a woman who has not formerly dressed well for the home but starts dressing up that maybe her friends and relatives will ridicule her because that makes them so uncomfortable because now they're going to have to behave with a little more dignity around her and it makes it gives them a standard and they don't like it they're not comfortable with it if your hair your clothes and your posture are respectable you will naturally feel more respect for yourself if you can live in such a way as to build a genuine self-respect regardless of any material disadvantage you may have you may have such as lack of money physical appearance or lack of social prestige you will build a self dignity which will make it easy for you to feel equal to every other human being so i uh, i'm going to stop there she has a lot more to say about it but i think i've um i think i have uh, explored that very well and so I'll just go through some of my notes and then um, we'll go to some of the other things. So I want to emphasize this, don't demean yourself uh, and don't be inferior. If uh, you don't need to, if you're uneasy around people or someone has given you a compliment and makes you uneasy, just say thank you. Uh, and if you're uneasy, that's the reason most people will demean themselves or say something inferior about it. We also are real self-conscious that maybe we don't want people to think that we are snobs and that we are doing too well. So we will say, oh, uh, someone gave me that for free or something like that. And we need to just keep quiet about it. They don't need to. Let's, let's have some secrets and some mystery. Uh, they don't need to know everything about ourselves. Um, and so follow some of those things about be having self-dignity and let me see what else I can have oh uh, I wanted to mention this about uh, the after church letdown or the after uh, social activity letdown or the after shopping let down you come home maybe you've been around people it's been rather stimulating and you come home and and you can feel uh rather blue i don't know why they use the word blue because i love blue but why don't we say gray i suppose that would hurt the feelings of those who love gray but they used to call it gray you know the gray day um and that is to always have extra plans after the event like after church have uh, uh, other plans that you're going to do after church, uh, when you get home, something special or something to do the rest of the day, even if you go on a little drive, um, and uh, have after after activity blue after activity activities because some people do suffer from this and children do too. That after church go straight home and and life is seems to be rather bleak to them. So have some kind of uh, some kind of plans. So now, uh, let me see what I have on my list here. And I hope you're getting a lot done while you um, 
while you listen. I uh, ran across this uh, question here is how can I defend my country without going and joining the military or going into war? And it didn't take me long to start babbling on about how you can defend your country. <laughs> you know, no country can be conquered whose people have uh, a set of values that won't let them be infiltrated by false teachings, by um, by things harmful harmful things that you might uh, eat or drink or breathe. Uh, if you have if the, the people have a strong set of values, it's harder to uh, conquer. You, it's easier to defend your country by having good values and good character. It's so much better that way. Uh, and uh, so that was just my, just and since we've been discussing character these last couple times, um, character will mean you won't fall for anything, that you won't do things for for the enemy that brings your country down in a way. Uh, we used to be told uh, that if you uh, if you weren't uh, you know careful in business, that that was bad for your country or something like that. So. Uh, the best way to defend your country, if you want to teach your children that, the best way to defend your country is to have extremely good values. Really work hard on character. Study it and uh, practice it. Uh, that's a big subject there. Um, now another thing I'd like to talk about today is sleep. Because uh, you remember a long time ago I, I linked to an article some, where someone had researched on the second sleep on how it was quite common for people to wake up in the night and get up for a few hours, have something to eat, walk the dog, uh, go outside and uh, read or come in and read. Uh, and it was, it was quite common to get up in the night. Uh, and uh, I believe that the person that wrote the article also mentioned the prophet David in the Psalms that talked about uh, early will I seek thee and then uh, a little little reference to the the first watch or the second watch and we talked about watch you know it was every three or four hours when you uh, traded the uh, guard you know and wa and stayed awake and watched and he talked about waking up in the watch and praying to God and praying and that's what people would do they woke up in the night well then they would have prayers and maybe a little more reading and uh, something to drink or something to eat and then they go back to bed and sleep till eight o'clock but uh, so you're going to have times and you don't have to be vital for this to happen to you where you will think you have a sleep disorder because you didn't sleep through the night and it will aggravate you no end because you feel kind of groggy and uh, you also believe that you're supposed to sleep and it could be that maybe you didn't need to sleep over something that uh, is going on in your body that means that you didn't sleep and what I have what I have done when that has happened to me is I just get up and I don't wrestle with it I don't fight with it sleep has its own agenda and I'm not going to play games so I just get up and I find something to do I might even go ahead and get dressed and uh, and sit down and write a letter or watch a movie or something instead of wrestling with it and making yourself miserable I might get up and have something to eat and, and have a cup of uh, herbal tea and um, so that's all I have to say about that is I'm not I don't fight it anymore because if you start thinking that there's something wrong with you now nobody stays awake forever eventually you're going to catch up you are going to go to sleep and it could be you've had too much of some kind of whatever you know nutrient or something that has stimulated your wakey wakiness and uh, you don't know and if uh, too often we turn to the allopathic uh, solutions which are very bad for our bodies and uh, so I just wanted to say that's one thing I do this doesn't suit everybody this is just my opinion but I don't fight with it if I if I feel like I'm not going to sleep and I'll look at the clock and say well you know I haven't slept I will get up for a while I might even uh, do my exercise but mostly it's quiet stuff I think where the problem is if you've got other people in the house and you don't want to disturb them so you feel you have to lay there and uh, so uh, make sure you have plenty of good books to read now 
when I taught a courtesy class one time to young people, uh, they were very young, and I would teach them, and I wanted to use a Bible word, and the Bible in the New Testament talks about be courteous one to another. So I wanted to, instead of calling it an etiquette class or a manners class, I wanted to call it a courtesy class and use a, a Bible word from the New Testament. And uh, I started with uh, the countenance. I started with the with the expression of body expression and facial expression and um, how how that affects you uh, emotionally and mentally and can help your mood and help you to be nice to people and that's what courtesy is is just being nice being nice to people and being gracious to everyone uh, and sometimes it'll hit you somebody will just rub you the wrong way and you'll think oh they just I just don't feel like being nice but you know that you are becoming more gracious when you can be uh, gentle and nice to them too um, so I wanted to mention that the courtesy class, but I remember hearing uh, when people discuss these kind of classes, you know, like uh, etiquette, courtesy, manners, that everybody's different, you know, and that uh, you, you can't uh, apply it to everyone. Uh, but pleasantness and goodness and kindness is good for everyone. And yes, everyone is different, but pleasantness and kindness and the teaching of goodness are for everyone no matter how different they are they can adapt it to their own um, personality let's see if I've got anything else here now I wanted to get into homemaking because I always have a little homemaking section here and this will be just brief but uh, I hope you're getting something done while you listen and uh, I always remember Emma's quote, there's a grim job to be done, and I always like to adapt that to homemaking. Uh, there's always some mess to clean up. But I uh, think it might be uh, very entertaining for you and rather amusing. If you think of yourself, if you find a grim job, we all have those little corners we don't want to get into. I've got I'm thinking of one right now. I even had a bad dream about it, that it was so bleak and so black. I had to put a warning sign on the door that no one could enter in it, you know, and that it went on for years, and after a while, no one knew what was in there, and even I was afraid to go in there. But uh, you think of yourself as someone else, or you think of your place as somewhere else, and that you this is your job, someone else that has to come in and do this job for this family, and uh, think of yourself as someone that has to do a very good job because uh, the reputation will go on to the business that you own. So that's a good way to think of to think of a grim job is think of yourself as someone else who's come into the place and uh, is trying to make uh, sense of it, or think of the place as somewhere else. And the fun thing to do is to go down the little road and check the mail from the mailbox and bring the mail back in and act like you're visiting and uh, or act like you're the the uh, hired help and you come in and clean it up and you're not even there don't even think about it uh, you're not even emotional about it and so And so I want to just be sure that I read something from uh, Winsome Womanhood um, by Margaret Elizabeth Sangster uh, from 18, 1900, and um, remember who she is. Um, and I just wanted to read, this was for 15-year-old girls, but I think that you could start at 8 and still love a book like this and still enjoy it. And you could write, you could get a notebook, a little folder, and... Um, put some paper in it and write a little workbook to yourself for your for your daughter or son so you could adapt this to boys too you know, simple things that they can do but this is what the message was for projects for a girl of 15 and I, and I really believe some could be younger number one this was the assignment at the end of a chapter of the um, of the things that she likes to do Number one, find a simple sewing pattern and learn how to use a needle or a machine. And it's uh, 
someone sent me a link recently of a uh, someone who was showing uh, all the advantages of sewing by hand how you could move to a more comfortable chair and how you could look around and how you could sit and how you could move the fabric uh, it was more flexible and uh, so I have been doing a lot more of hand stitching because of that um, it also is less uh, tense factory type work you know when you're sewing you're leaning forward you're looking at something and it's um, it's a labor you know so she says or choose a craft store kit that teaches you how to do something this craft can develop into gifts and give a give even give you a little business start number two and I've seen those uh, craft kits. They're at Hobby Lobby, they're at Walmart, they're at other places. Purchase a sketch pad and begin filling it with illustrations of your life. The moments captured in your drawings with a brief description is your prettiest hand in your prettiest handwriting will long be treasured. Or work at develop that handwriting into calligraphy, a discipline that will give both pleasure and long service. How about putting the family photo collection into a memory book? or create a book of heirloom pictures for your family's history. I wish I'd known years ago that you should really go to, uh, this is years ago, to go to a copy shop and get the photographs copied and then paste them into a special book. Uh, because I think I took some old black and white ones, which weren't old at the time, but it was during the era of black and white film. And uh, we always bought the black and white film because it was cheaper. And uh, I remember getting the photos back and tape pasting them with white paste into uh, a photo album. And of course, uh, it didn't occur to me you could actually kind of clip around them and, and just clip them right out of the photo album. And I was trying to get them off. Um, so uh, now listen to this. This is interesting. Uh, now this is written by the commentator Shelley Noonan, who added the. Uh, the devotional journal to it and so she says television is one of the most common and subtle time thieves for one week monitor the amount of time you watch television multiply this by four and then by twelve in this way you will be able to estimate the approximate number of hours you would spend in one year watching TV does this number shock you try see because watching something is very passive that's why I tell you to get to work while you listen um, so you can be active Try uh, getting control of the TV by setting up viewing times and limiting the number of hours spent. When you do this, use the saved time for some family fun or encourage individual growth by reading, reading or developing a new hobby. So I thought that was uh, very insightful. This is called uh, Win Some Womanhood and it's for 15 year old girls. So I think you'd write your own just in a notebook by hand for your children. And let me see, there was, oh yes. Jane Austen who can uh, who can forget that so I'm going to read to you about that Jane Austen all right I found the most delightful if you want something to listen to see I've got to have something to listen to too and I'm not going to listen to this but um, yeah, I'll find all the mistakes and then I'll take it down so I found a um, a YouTube channel and I thought well, I just want to listen to somebody talking about Jane Austen and I found just the best thing and I believe it was only it was only 45 minutes I could go for a walk or I could clean out something oh I just really enjoyed this it gave me it'll give you something to sink your teeth into to listen I, I believe only the uh, maybe the more older women I don't know if children would would get this. I probably wouldn't have even got it at the age of 18. I, I probably wouldn't have, but it's called Online Conversation Reading Jane Austen, A Novel Approach to Virtue. Uh, and so this woman did an excellent job explaining how uh, Jane Austen used uh, the teaching of virtue, the practice of goodness, in her novels in many different ways to emphasize the point. And one of them was, I forget what it's called, like irony. And, uh, you know, irony is when uh, maybe you're doing something and you and you uh, have make a mistake and you say, well, that was brilliant. It's the opposite of what it is, but it just puts a little bit of uh, levity in it. And um, so I will put this link here for you to have something extra to listen to. And while I'm at it, 
when I read uh, at the beginning, remember I read about the Queen of Sheba, and she said to Solomon, the half has never yet been told. She said, I, I see what you have, and I'm amazed, and it's true, and I didn't believe it till I saw it, but behold, the half has never yet been told. Well, I went online, and I don't know how I did it, but I got a piece of free sheet music. Uh, it didn't charge me, and I ran it off on my copy machine, and it was called The Half Has Never Yet Been Told, and it was written in 1879, and behold, I remember my mother singing the chorus while she was washing the dishes back in the 1950s because it was in that old church hymnal songbook that we had. Some of those old songs were there, and uh, I always remembered it because she was singing it, and... Um, so I gave everybody a copy, and uh, the lady that had wanted the extra tea bag said, could I have an extra copy for my husband so we can sing it together? <laughs> so I have to be really careful how I conduct this class because I know that uh, she's taking it all home to her husband. <laughs> it's got to be very dignified. And uh, so I will put the song and the sheet music on the page on the post for you so you can have that so I've got a lot of work to do to get that fixed up and now to finish it off we're going to do a little bit of wives and daughters and of course I'm I'm on a character uh, rampage here and and we're just gonna do character for a few more days and then we we'll, might go on to something else but the point of the whole thing is that you can listen while you work and uh, so we see that Molly has met her stepmother-to-be. Uh, she's uh, very shy. She's not sure she likes her and uh, very sad because she knows she's going to be losing all those precious hours with her father. Now that he's married, he will be uh, paying attention to his wife. And so Molly uh, goes to see Mrs. Kirkpatrick, the widow, that her father is going to marry and she's at Lady Cumner's house so that's where she meets her I think she's doing things for Lady Cumner and uh, so uh, she's I think I'll start here where Mrs. Cumner meets her and she says to Claire uh, she says to Claire uh, Yes, I like her looks, Claire. So she's talking. It's nothing more aggravating, is there, to be in a room and someone's talking about you in, as though you're not? Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, I like her looks, Claire. You may make something of her. Oh, how insulting. How would you like to be standing there and somebody says, you know, you have potential. You, you could make something of yourself. <laughs> you know, they still do that, even though I'm vital. People still do that, and you'll find that they never quit. It will be a great advantage to you, my dear, to have a lady who has trained up several young people. Remember, Claire was a governess. governess. That's the one her father's going to marry. And uh, it will be a great advantage to you, my dear, to have a lady who has trained up several young people of quality, always about you, just, just uh, at the time when you are growing up. And I'll tell you what, Claire, a sudden thought striking her, and they did a very good job of this in the movie, Wives and Daughters, uh, the BBC production. And this scene uh, is just perfect the way it's written. They did it very well. Uh, and this, the thought struck her, and so she was like, oh, I know. <laughs> Um, you and she must become better acquainted. You know nothing of each other at present. You are not to be married till Christmas. And what could be better than that she should go back with you to the school at Ashcombe? Um, because Claire worked at as a teacher at a, a girls' school. She would be with you constantly and have the advantage of the companionship of your young people which would be a good thing for an only child. It's a capital plan. I'm very glad I thought of it. And Molly says, I don't think it would be nice at all. I mean, my lady, that I should dislike it very much. It would be taking me away from Papa just these very few months. I will like you, she went on, her eyes full of tears. And turning to Mrs. Kirkpatrick, she put her hand into the future stepmother's hand 
with the prettiest and most trustful action. I will try hard to love you and to do all I can to make you happy, but you must not take me away from Papa just this very last bit of time that I shall have him. Mrs. Kirkpatrick fondled the hand thus placed in hers, and was grateful to the girl for her outspoken opposition to Lady Cumnor's plan. And you can see in the movie that though they didn't say this, Mrs. Kirkpatrick was just really didn't want to take her back to the school at Ashcombe. Claire was, however, exceedingly unwilling to back up Molly by any words of her own until Lady Cumnor had spoken and given the cue. But there was something in Molly's little speech or in her straightforward manner that amused instead of irritated Lady Cumnor in her present mood. Perhaps she was tired of the silkiness with which she had been shut up for many days. She put up her glasses and looked at them both before speaking. Then she said, Upon my word, young lady, why, Claire, you've got your work before you, probably because Molly was so outspoken. How would you like to be? Do you know, even a little child knows when they've been insulted and when they're being treated like an inferior. Even a five-year-old and a six-year-old will blush when someone's talking about them in a negative manner, like, well, uh, you've got your work cut out for you. Not but what there is a good deal of truth in what she says. It must be very disagreeable to a girl of your age to have a stepmother coming in between fa your father and yourself, whatever may be the advantages in the long run. Molly almost felt as if she could make a friend of this stiff old countess for her clearness of sight as to the plan proposed being a trial. But she was afraid in her newborn desire of thinking for others of Mrs. Kirkpatrick being hurt. She need not have feared as far as outward signs went, for the smile was still on that lady's pretty rosy lips, and the soft fondling of her hand never stopped. I believe in the book they portrayed Claire as a little more soft, a little more flexible, a little more yielding than she appeared in the movie. Uh, Lady Cumnor was more interested in Molly the more she looked at her, and her gaze was pretty steady throughout her gold-rimmed eyeglasses. She began a sort of catechism, a string of very straightforward questions, such as any lady under the rank of countess might be scrupled to ask, but which were not unkindly meant. You're sixteen, are you not? No, I'm seventeen. My birthday was three weeks ago. Very much the same thing, I should think. Have you ever been to school? What a thing to say. There is a big difference when you're that age, when you're 16, uh, when you're 17, and someone says you're 16, and they say there's no difference. Oh, that would have just broken my heart. Every year is special when you're young. No, never. Have you ever been to school? No, never. Miss Ear, who has taught me, uh, Miss Ear was someone who, who lived in the village that was her teacher, and she was her tutor. No, never. Miss Ear has taught me everything I know. Umph! Miss Ear was your governess, I suppose. I should not have thought your father could have afforded to keep a governess, but of course he must know his own affairs best. Certainly, my lady, replied Molly, a little touchy as to any reflections on her father's wisdom. My goodness, this woman is just tearing down her, all of her life. You say certainly as if it was a matter of course that everyone should know their own affairs best. You are very young, Miss Gibson, very. You'll know better before you come to my age. Oh, don't you just hate being talked to you like that? Miss Gibson, very. I remember somebody said something like that to me. Well, when you've been around a bit and, and you've had experiences like I have uh, and you've grown a bit older, you know, you'll understand this or you'll do that. And, and then I found out later that I was 10 years older than she was. Um, <clears throat> uh, so she said, uh, you're very young, Miss Gibson, very, you'll know better before you come to my age, and I suppose you've been taught music and the use of globes and French and all the usual accomplishments since you have had a governess. I never heard of such nonsense. She went on lashing herself up. An only daughter. If there had been a half a dozen, there might have been some sense in it. Molly did not speak, but it was by a strong effort that she kept silence. Mrs. Kirkpatrick fondled her hand more perseveringly than ever, hoping thus to express a sufficient amount of sympathy to prevent her from saying anything injudicious. 
But the caress had become wearisome to Molly and only irritated her nerves. She took out her hand from Mrs. Pat Kirkpatrick and a slight manifestation of impatience. It was perhaps fortunate for the general peace that just at this moment Mr. Gibson was announced. It is odd enough to see how the entrance of a person of the opposite sex into an assemblage of either men or women calms down the little discordances and the disturbance of mood. Yes, sometimes a, a lady would enter a gentleman's room where the gentlemen were having a, a heated discussion over politics and they all just kind of relax. And it's the same when a man would come into a room where the women were talking and uh, they would just all kind of let go of the tension. It was the case now. As Mr. Gibson's entrance, my lady took off her glasses and smoothed her brow. Mrs. Crookpatrick managed to get up a very becoming blush. At Molly, her face glowed with delight, and the white teeth and pretty dimples came on like sunlight on a landscape. Okay, that's as far as I can read with that. And let me just check and see if there was something else I wanted to wanted to talk about and I might just save some of it for the next time um, yes Jane Austen uh, so I had said that I was going to leave you a link for something else to listen to so I want to read to you about Jane Austen's world and it's from the website Jane Austen's world and uh, it's called greetings and and I also leave a link to it for you. Greetings and gestures in Austen's novels, and this is what somewhat I was talking about when, in a, uh, a last year sometime, I made a video about how sometimes when we're younger we look down at down on small talk and we say, well, that's not of any consequences, and I want to talk about things that have meat in them. I want to have, you know, real stimulating conversation, but everybody wants to say hi how are you how are things on the farm uh how are your potatoes this year and you're just like uh when you're young you don't you don't like that so much but it shows how it was like having soup before dinner it prepared your stomach for the heavier food and it was like uh having um uh small talk before the heavier talk came so that everyone starts to feel at ease and um uh, what am I trying to think it's what it's like it's like walking up a pathway to the door before you get to the door it's like uh, just a prelude in a, a musical composition um, it's like preparing the canvas for the painting um, so understanding the subtle nuances behind formal introductions and com customary greetings during Jane Austen's lifetime is a lot of fun and it can provide a unique level of insight into her books the reason Austen uses breaches of etiquette and manners as commentaries in her characters. Yes, she used these simple things that happened in everyday life in her time as part of her plot. In her, uh, in Jane Austen's novels, a person's social behavior is the external manifestation of his moral character, and I explained that in the previous video. Austin utilizes greetings such as formal introductions, handshakes, courtesies, bows. I would like to just have uh, bows, hat tipping, and curtsies. And even the infamous cut in order to help drive her plots, provide insightful information about her characters, and give hints to their readers. Making introductions. Now see, people don't really make introductions very much. Uh, and I always thought they were just too complicated. Uh, we'd get in a, an introduction class, sometimes even in school they had them, and uh, there were rules about who introduced first, and then who who you introduced first. Did you introduce your friend first, or the person you're introducing their friend to? And it just was so complicated. Uh, I like what they're doing now. They just say, hi, I'm such and such, who are you? <laughs> and this is my friend. <laughs> Throughout her novels, Jane Austen makes clever use of the rule that two strangers cannot interact socially until they have been properly introduced by a third party or mutual acquaintance. You know, that rule kind of went clear into the 1950s, and I'm so glad it's it's gone. It was very hard for me. I don't know why. I guess I just, that was something I just couldn't grasp. I'm too artistic. Um... Today, it might seem rude to mingle with someone in a social setting and not introduce ourselves. But, 
genteel people who had not been introduced simply did not speak to one another. Now, in some places in this country, if you're at a grocery store and you make some comment about something that you you and some stranger are just looking at or whatever, they'll look at you and say, "Do I know you?" Because <laughs> you don't you don't talk to just anybody unless they know you. <laughs> uh, so now, uh, so here's uh, some characters in Jane Austen's novels. When they find a place for tea next to a large party of people, they even spend the meal without having anything to do there or anybody to speak to except each other because they couldn't find a third party to introduce them. And uh, Austin also uses this rule of introduction as the essential hook that grabs the reader's attention at the beginning of Pride and Prejudice when Mrs. Bennett harasses Mr. Bennett to pay a visit to Mr. Bingley. Among the gentry in the country, when someone moved into a neighborhood, it was polite for his neighbors to call on him. I think that still is so. Obviously, Mr. Bennett must introduce himself so that his daughters can meet Mr. Bingley. However, there is another reason for Mrs. Bennett's insistence. Once the call is made, it must be returned. Virtually all visits required a reciprocal visit so that once one started visiting at a particular house, it was hard to stop. Now, I find that interesting because that used to be uh, kind of the unwritten rule that if someone invited you over, you invited them back. But then we were taught as Christians that you do things of your own free will and you do it for the glory of God and to serve the other people uh, without any expectation of reimbursement or for them to uh, invite you back. You just don't worry about that. And while that's true, I and I heartily agree with that. We do it, uh, we do it because of love, and care and concern for others. But others who have been served all their life and allow other people to invite them over, but never, never try to return the favor in any way, uh, they're doing a great disservice. They need to remember. And I remember. Uh, a young lady at church who when she turned 25 she says it just occurred to me that maybe I should take my turn to do something for other people because she grew up there and she was always uh, you know people took her under her, their wing invited her over uh, she was well liked by other families and then she said when she turned 25 she says you know I should be having some people over too I should take my it's now time for me to grow up and do some of these things well ladies I think I've gone on and on way too too much and too far and I haven't been for my Regency walk yet and it must be goodness it's five in the afternoon and it's still light outside so I'm going to go and I hope you have a lovely time and thank you for all you do for me and I love you and I'll talk to you later bye